Criminal State, A Closer Look at Israel's Role in Terrorism by Jeff Gates Part 1 When asked on September the 11th, 2001, what the attacks meant for U.S.-Israeli relations, former Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu responded, It's very good. Well, it's not good, but it will generate immediate sympathy for Israel. Game theory war planners rely on mathematical models to anticipate and shape outcomes with staged provocations. For the agent provocateur, the reactions to a provocation, as well as the reactions to those reactions, thereby become predictable within an acceptable range of probabilities. With ongoing wars in Iraq and Afghanistan poised to expand to Iran and Pakistan, it is time to take a closer look at how conflicts are catalyzed by way of deception. When Israeli game theorist Robert J. Auman received the 2005 Nobel Prize in Economic Science, he conceded from Jerusalem, the entire school of thought that we have developed here in Israel has turned Israel into the leading authority in this field. A professor at the Center for the Study of Rationality at Hebrew University, Alman's Nobel lecture, titled War and Peace, expounded on the rationality of war. With a well-modeled provocation, a target's anticipated reaction can even become a weapon in the aggressor's arsenal. In response to the provocation of 9-11, how difficult was it to foresee that the U.S. would deploy its military to avenge that attack, with U.S. intelligence fixed by well-placed insiders around a predetermined goal, how difficult was it to anticipate that the reaction to 9-11 could be redirected to wage war in Iraq? The emotional component of a provocation plays a key role in game theory warfare. With a nationally televised mass murder of 3,000 people, a state of shock, grief and outrage made it easier for Americans to believe that a known evil doer in Iraq was responsible, regardless of the facts. For false beliefs to displace real facts requires mental preconditioning so that a targeted population can be persuaded to put their faith in fictions. That conditioning enhances the probability of a successful deception. Those who deceived the U.S. to invade Iraq in March 2003 began a decade beforehand to lay the mental threads and make the requisite mental associations to advance that agenda. Notable among those threads was the 1993 publication in Foreign Affairs of a theme-setting article by Harvard University professor Samuel Huntington. By the time his analysis appeared in book-length form in 1996 as The Clash of Civilizations, more than 100 think tanks were prepared to promote it. The result created a widely touted narrative, a thematic storyline supporting a clash consensus five years before 9-11 provided a plausible rationale for war. Also published in 1996 under the guidance of Richard Pearl was A Clean Break, a new strategy for securing the realm, that is Israel a member since 1987 of the U.S. Defense Policy Board, this self-professed Zionist became its chairman in 2001. As an advisor to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, Pearl's Pentagon advisory post provided a powerful insider position to shape the national security mindset around the removal of Saddam Hussein, a key theme of a clean break, released five years before 9-11. That same year, Netanyahu addressed a joint session of Congress at the invitation of Newt Gingrich, the Christian Zionist Speaker of the House. Murders, books, articles, think tanks and well-placed insiders are common components in a probabilistic model deployed by war-planning game theorists. Lawmakers are also a customary ingredient. They provide credibility and a facade of legitimacy a critical element when inducing a nation to war with phony intelligence fixed around a preset agenda. That role was eagerly filled by Senators John McCain, Joe Lieberman, a Jewish Zionist from Connecticut, and John Kyle, 
a Christian Zionist from Arizona, when they co-sponsored the Iraq Liberation Act of 1998. The hard fact is that so long as Saddam remains in power, he threatens the well-being of his people, the peace of his region, the security of the world. The best By promoting Israel's 1996 agenda for securing the realm, their legislation laid yet another mental thread in the public mindset by calling for the ouster of Saddam Hussein three years before 9-11. The legislation also appropriated $97 million to promote their agenda. Distracted by midterm congressional elections and impeachment proceedings, catalyzed by a well-timed presidential affair with White House intern Monica Lewinsky, Bill Clinton signed that Zionist agenda into law in October 1998, four and a half years before a U.S.-led invasion removed the Iraqi leader. After 9-11, McCain and Lieberman became inseparable travel companions and irrepressible advocates for the invasion of Iraq. Striking a presidential pose aboard the aircraft carrier USS Theodore Roosevelt in January 2002, McCain, a son and grandson of admirals, laid another mental thread when he waved an admiral's cap and proclaimed, On to Baghdad! By way of deception. The confidence with which this game theory strategy progressed in plain sight could be seen in the behavior of Deputy Defense Secretary Paul Wolfowitz, another Zionist insider. Four days after 9-11, while in a principal's meeting at Camp David, he proposed that the U.S. invade Iraq. At that time, the intelligence did not point to Iraqi involvement, and Osama bin Laden was thought to be hiding in a remote region of Afghanistan. On that same day, San Diego FBI Special Agent Stephen Butler interrogated Iraqi Munta Ghazal at his home near San Diego to determine if he was funding Mel Rockefeller, an American with whom Ghazal traveled to Baghdad in early 1997. After meeting for several days with a top nuclear physicist with oversight of Iraq's mothballed nuclear weapons program, Rockefeller returned to the U.S., with a practical proposal for removing Saddam Hussein without this war and without triggering an insurgency. When regional specialists of the U.S. Department of State would not meet with him, he traveled to Ottawa in April 1997, where he met with Middle East specialists in the Canadian government to ensure a written record was made to confirm there was an alternative to war in Iraq, six years before the invasion. Instead of debriefing him, FBI agents sought to discredit him. Though FBI agents interviewed Ghazal many times, they have yet to meet with Mel Rockefeller. Agent Butler cashed checks and paid rent for two San Diego-based men who allegedly piloted two of the planes on 9-11. The same Iman counseling Major Nidal Hassan with FBI knowledge before he was transferred to Fort Hood also counseled the alleged San Diego-based hijackers with FBI knowledge. As of December the 1st, 2009, no one from the FBI or National Security had debriefed Mel Rockefeller, eight years after 9-11. When President George H.W. Bush declined to invade Baghdad and remove Saddam Hussein during the 1991 Gulf War, Pentagon Under Secretary for Policy Paul Wolfowitz imposed a no-fly zone in northern Iraq. By the invasion of March 2003, the Israeli Mossad had agents deployed for a decade in the northern Iraqi city of Mosul. Intelligence reports of Iraqi ties to al-Qaeda were also traced to Mosul, reports that proved false. Mosul again emerged in November 2004 as a center of the insurgency that destabilized Iran. That reaction precluded the speedy exit of coalition forces promised in congressional testimony by senior war planner Wolfowitz in the lead-up to the invasion. It's hard to conceive that it would take more forces to provide stability in post-Saddam Iraq than it would take to conduct the war itself and to secure the surrender of Saddam's security forces in his army. Hard to imagine. 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 Hard to imagine.